Good to see everybody. Woo! Good afternoon. So how many of you are actually ready for Christmas? That's what I want to know. Who's all like, you guys are at, your, you have all your presents wrapped and you're all set under a tree? Overachiever. Man, that's awesome. I'm like so jealous of you right now. I need to pray about that. That's great. Uh, so we're all in the Johnston house getting ready, doing all sorts of stuff. We have stuff, a couple presents to wrap us in a lot. So, uh, But we have all that stuff going on. Most of you know that I have little kids in my house. And so I'm totally in the little kids season of life uh, for Christmas. And so one of the things that my wife Leah and I did uh, this past weekend, not this weekend, but the weekend before, was we took our kids to go see Santa Claus and sit on his lap and take a picture. And it was, it was great. But can I show you the gem of a picture we got from it all? Can I show you this? Go ahead and throw it up there, guys. Look at that. <laughs> That's my little boy, Cade, and uh, my daughter, Tessa. And what Cade is striking, what I like to affectionately call the, my life is over and I'm dying face. <laughs> Who is this strange man holding me? And Tessa's just looking at him like, what? You have a problem, man. What's wrong with you? <laughs> So that doesn't have anything to do with the Bible or the message today. I just wanted to share it. So there you go. Uh, so that's what's going on in our life and our house. Are really, we are really excited about it. But speaking of kids and stuff, uh, the, one of the things that um, we've been doing is we've been watching all the Christmas cartoons and all that stuff. My, my family and I, we stream a lot of our TV. We've cut the cord like with cable stuff. And so all the Christmas cartoons that are on Netflix, we've watched them all, seen them all, and that's all Cade wants to watch these days. And so I've come here this morning to actually pick a fight. I've come to pick a fight with Pastor Dale. <laughs> now, you've heard him talk the past couple weeks that there is only one Ebenezer Scrooge, and it is George C. Scott. And everyone else, quote, yeah, okay, you agree with him. That's nice. I've come to pick a fight with you, too. All right, so they, uh, according to these guys, that there is, everyone else is a pretender. There's no other Ebenezer Scrooge. Well, Pastor Dale, D uh, Cade and I have a disagreement, and we're here to pick a fight with you. We think that this is actually the right Scrooge. <laughs> this is Uncle Scrooge McDuck, not Mr. Scrooge, Uncle Scrooge McDuck. And this is from the Disney version of The Christmas Carol. How many of you have seen that? It's a great, it's a classic. It's on, yeah, so we watched it on Netflix. Cade watched it this morning when he was eating his cereal and we were getting ready for church. Uh, and so it's uh, so good. So there's uh, Scrooge McDuck, he's, uh, he's obviously Scrooge, um, but then there's the rest of the Christmas Carol, Christmas Carol characters, like uh, uh, jo the ghost of Jacob Marley is played by Goofy, yeah, and then there's the three ghosts, the ghost of Christmas past is played by Jiminy Cricket, and there he is, and then the ghost of Christmas present is played by this giant character. Remember him from like the Jack and the Beanstalk old Disney cartoons? I discovered in the last service his name is Willie. So there we go. Now you learned something. You're welcome. All right, so his name is Willie the Giant. And then the ghost of Christmas future is played by uh, Pete. So you can't really see in that picture, but Pete is like the big kind of cat looking guy. He's always, you know, Goofy's nemesis and cartoons and stuff like that. So uh, it's great. It's a lot of fun. Great, great, great movie. Now, why in the world am I talking to you about Scrooge McDuck and Disney cartoons and all sorts of stuff like that? Well, because in the Christmas Carol and a lot of other stuff that we have around the Christmas season, it's actually profoundly spiritual. Like these things, whether you consider yourself a spiritual person or not in our culture, it brings up issues of like there are like spirits and ghosts and all sorts of stuff. This is a Halloween. This is Christmas. And we talk about this at this time of the year. Where's my It's a Wonderful Life, people? Woo! Yeah. Okay. Angels, spirits. It's spiritual. That, it's a spiritual movie. This is a spiritual movie. We don't think of Christmas time as the really spiritual time culturally speaking, but it is, it is, because we keep talking about all this stuff. Here's my point, is that today I want to use this as a launching point for talking about some spiritual things today. Here at Community of Hope, we strive to make all of our messages practical and applicable. We want them to have meaning to your life, something that you could do something with. But even if that's our aim, we still speak and preach different types of messages. So uh, we preach messages that are like great life hacks, uh, as in like a, 
what does the Bible have to say about your finances and how to spend your money or how to fix some of your broken relationships or how to spend your time more wisely? The Christian scriptures talk about all these things. Some of those are very, very um, uh, life hack, very practical, applicable to what we do. And then there are some sermons where it's primarily about what you think. Still practical, still applicable, but it's not so much about what you're doing, but what you're thinking what you think about God. Like we did a sermon series about this stuff in the fall called The God I Wish You Knew. We're challenging everyone's thinking about God. Still practical, still applicable, different type of message. Well, today, instead of one about what you do and what you think, today I'm going to talk to you, like I said, about a spiritual subject matter. What we're going to be talking about today in a way is really mysterious and almost a little, little nebulous But this is the gift of Jesus, that he is such a good teacher, and that when he talks about what we're going to jump into today, he brings about a way of talking about it that helps us wrap our heads around something that's profoundly spiritual and mysterious. So I want you guys to buckle in and come along for the ride with me and just hear me out for the rest of the morning. Good? Yes, we're all in? Hear me out. Okay, great. Awesome. All right, well, we're in this sermon series called Welcome Home. And Pastor Dale and I are basing it entirely off of John chapter 1, verse 14. So if you have your Bible, turn there now. If you have your phone, open up the Bible app that you have. And it'll be on the screen, on your sermon notes, whatever. Whatever works best for you. Uh, so Pastor Dale preached the past two weeks some great messages for us. He talked about, first off, when normal doesn't work anymore. And he had that really funny catchphrases that he had that the incarnation, which is what we're celebrating, what we're talking about, it's the Christian idea that God became a human being named Jesus. That's what Christmas is all about. Oh, that's what John 1.14 is all about. So Jesus, uh, the idea that he, God became a human being in Jesus changes everything. When normal doesn't work anymore, he talked about the incarnation. Christmas changes how you see things. It's a new view, a new do, and who remembers the last one? A new you. you. Look, it's, they remembered that, Dale. Aren't you proud of them? That's awesome. He's blushing. He's still embarrassed he did that to you guys. Uh, So that was a great message. And then last week he talked about when knowledge ain't enough anymore. And he's talking about experiencing Jesus by faith and what is faith like. It was very helpful for my own faith journey. I commend it to you to go download both those on our podcast and check it out. So, uh, but what we're going to be doing today is we're going to have a conversation around four different Bible verses that have a common thread weaved through all of them. I want you to follow me. Each one of the four things has four points, and they're all about the same idea and concept. So let's dive into it. John chapter 1, verse 14 says this, and you can follow along on the screen. The Word became flesh. Why don't we read it all together? The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. If you are taking notes uh, maybe you, the, the notes that we handed out in your, uh, your Connect folder or maybe in your Bible if you like to write in your Bible or on your phone, highlight, whatever it is. Uh, go ahead and circle or down, or pff, not download. Wow. Too much coffee. That's okay. Go ahead and underline the phrase, made his dwelling. Made his dwelling. This is such an important phrase in my study that I found uh, this passage this week. These three words in English are actually one word in the original Greek that this was written in. It's talking about the action of God. It's easy to get consumed with where did God make his dwelling all among us. That's cool, but it's what God did. And it's because of that word and these three English words underlined why some scholars say that John 1.14 is the most pivotal verse, the most important verse in the whole Bible. John 3.16 is the most famous. Every football fan knows that one. They've seen it on signs. But John 1.14 might be the most important because it's a climatic moment for what happens in this book. Let me explain. Who's seen Star Wars Episode 7 already? All right, good. A couple of us. It's awesome. If you're planning on it, enjoy it. It's great. Uh, So in the whole Star Wars saga... The most important climatic moment, it's not the end of the saga, but it's a climatic moment, is in Star Wars Episode V with the Empire Strikes Back. And there's the famous scene in it where Darth Vader reveals to Luke something, and he says, Luke, I am your father. father." Hey, spoiler alert, Darth Vader's Luke's dad, just in case you didn't know. 
And so if you take somebody who's never seen this movie before, and they've never seen the saga, but they've never even heard the cultural reference. I mean, it's going to be hard to have somebody completely removed from all this stuff, even if they don't care about the movies. Like, how many of you haven't seen any Star Wars movies? There's a slew of you. So you don't care. It's okay. But pretend you've never heard about it before. Pretend. Just go with me. Just work with me for crying out loud, okay? I worked really hard on this. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so come with me for this. With this thing, if they look at just the 30-second clip of that, climactic scene, but they don't have the rest of the story, it's going to make no sense. And it's an iconic scene in cinematic history. Same thing with John 1.14. It's a climactic moment, but if you don't know the context of the story, it's not going to mean much. So let me tell you the story real briefly. John 1.14 doesn't begin in John 1. It begins in Genesis 1. Genesis is the first book of the Bible. And in Genesis 1, God creates the world. He creates man and woman in his image and puts his divine imprint on them and walks in perfect relationship with them. And they live in a place called the Garden of Eden. Perfect relationship with God. Genesis 3, Adam and Eve, the first man and woman, choose to sin against God, to break his law in his heart. And thus, they get separated from God's presence. That's part of the curse of sin has lots of ramifications. The worst one is a severed friendship with God. And part of the consequences is they are exiled out of the Garden of Eden, and God watches as they leave into a broken world, and Adam and Eve, and then the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve walk off into a broken world and broken relationships away from God out of his presence. And the story of religion in the world goes along something like this. Behavior modification. Do things differently. And if you're good enough, you might be able to get back into the garden to be with God again. But that is not the story of Christianity. The story of the Christian scriptures is this. A loving and holy God sees his sons and his daughters walk out of his presence and he leaves the garden to go after them. That's the story of this book here. And so from Eden, all through the story of God's people, the Israelites, to a place called Bethlehem, from a garden to a manger, from the tree of life to a little town, the city of David, the city of Bethlehem, from the garden to a baby named Jesus, and he shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. So here's the first point I want you to know. God has come to be with us, and God has come to be with you. With you. That's what this is all about. Sure, Christmas is about a baby, but don't miss the bigger story. Christmas is about God coming to be with his people again because he loves his kids and will not be denied from their presence. That's the God that we worship. So remember, we're going through a string of verses, four in particular, and we're going to keep going. So God has come to be with us. Here's the second passage I want to look together. It's from Ephesians chapter 3. We looked at this last week with Pastor Dale. <clears throat> and I want you, we're going to read verse 16 and 17, and this is the apostle Paul praying. And he says this, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell. There's that word again. Made his dwelling among us. Remember that? We just read it. And now, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. The title of the message today, you see it on your notes, is when near isn't close enough. Because when God came in a baby in Bethlehem to be among his people, that wasn't his end game. Climactic moment, but God desires more. And what we can see from this verse here is that God does not just want to be among us, but God wants to be in us. This is the mysterious thing I was lifting up earlier. This is where it gets a little spiritual. Hang with me. It's going to be good. This concept Theologians call the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So God in the incarnation has come to dwell among us. But after Jesus lived his life, 
taught about the kingdom of God, healed the sick, and casted out demons. He was crucified on a cross, raised from the dead, and now he sends his Holy Spirit to come live in the hearts of his followers. It's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now, this can be a confusing thing. You might be sitting there going, Pastor Trevor, are you telling me that the Spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, wants to come live in my heart? What does that even mean? What does that even look like? It's odd. And so if you feel that way, congratulations, you're just like everybody else in here. It's a normal thing. That's why Jesus, when he talks about this, he applies a super helpful metaphor that I want to show you guys. So here's our first two points. Just to recap, God has come to be with us. And, uh, <laughs> well, yeah, what's the second one? There it is. God wants to, hey, thanks, you're taking notes. All right. God wants to live not just among us, but in us. Let's keep going with this thought. So here's the metaphor that Jesus brings up. It's in John chapter 14, verse 23, and it's going to be up on the screen. And Jesus here is teaching. He said, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. This is one verse amongst a slew of verses where Jesus creates the metaphor for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and it's this, point number three. Your heart is like a house, and God wants to move in. Your heart is like a house, and God wants to move in. Uh, for some of you, you might hear that and go, God wants to be like my roommate? Ooh, I haven't had good roommate experiences, Trevor. Are there any college students here on home from break? Any college students here? Have you always had a good roommate experience? Oh, good for you. <laughs> Me, not so much. Okay, that's all right. Um, let me tell you guys about one of the best roommates I've ever had. So this isn't going to end in bad things. It's going to end in good. Uh, was my friend Donovan. Some of you have met him. He's come to visit Community of Hope twice. Donovan and I were roommates at the Florida State University. <laughs> Woo, no booing. Stop that. That's hurtful. Okay. <laughs> and uh, we were roommates my sophomore year of college together. Um, and so it, if you asked Donovan... Was Pastor Trevor like a great roommate? Like he's a pastor. He must have done all the dishes and always kept his room clean and was super considerate. And, and he, would, he would laugh in your face and then start telling stories like this. Uh, when he, the room that he and I shared, was, I slept on a loft that was six feet uh, high off the ground. It was a tall loft. Six feet is high for me. I'm vertically challenged. <coughs> and uh, I slept on a loft and he slept on a bed underneath the loft. Well, I developed the bad habit of accidentally dropping things on his face while he was asleep. <laughs> so it started with like little things like I dropped my shirt on him. Well, that's just annoying. Ew, you know, whatever. But then, you know, the things got a little bit more dangerous and anger-inducing. Like uh, I, I dropped a water bottle on his face one time from six feet up, so dead asleep, pow, right in the face. Yeah. And then it got, it got kind of worse from there. I, I would listen to music in my bed um, on a portable CD player. I was in college before the iPod was invented. So, and so I was listening to my, remember those things where they had the anti-skip technology, you know, live from the pit of hell, okay. Uh, that was, man, that was funny in the other services. You guys don't remember those? Anti-skip, but they skipped all the time. Okay, whatever, whatever. I was apparently more frustrated about it than you guys. You're more patient than me. Good for you. So I would be listening to that, and it would slip through the cracks of the loft, and it would spin down, and I would look, and like, no, as it would spin all the way down, and would land splat, flat on his face while he was asleep. Oh, it was bad. And then uh, I did it again, actually, one time a week later, and it fell, but I caught it by the headphone cords, and it stopped right by his face. It just swung, there, like, sorry, go back to sleep. Everything's fine. Don't hate me. Okay. And so, yeah, I did frustrating things to my roommate, Donovan, but Donovan would also say this, that he and I, we've been some of each other's best friends ever since. I haven't lived with him for 11 years. He's still one of my closest friends. Here's the point. Your heart is a house and God wants to move in because who you live with is who you're supposed to be closest with. It's not like that in a broken world with broken homes and broken relationships. I get it. But who you live with is who you're supposed to be closest with who you share meals with, who you share life with, who you share sorrows with, who sees you at your best and your worst and loves and accepts you anyway, who you live with is who you're supposed to be closest to. So the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, 
it's a metaphor for the type of intimate friendship that God wants with you. God wants to be closer to you than anyone else in your life because God wants all of you. That's why he wants to come live in you. Jesus picks up the metaphor again later in Scripture. And he does this in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. This is a famous verse. Many of you have heard this before. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. He's talking about a house again. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. He wants to do life with them. Go ahead and throw up that picture I have. This is a, a famous half cheesy Christian painting. Um, Jesus is knocking on a door, but do you notice what's missing? There's no doorknob. See, here's what Jesus is getting at. Speaking metaphorically about a spiritual relationship he wants with you. He's going to knock on the door. That's a way of him saying, I'm going to get your attention in your life and in your heart to let you know I'm here. But then he's going to ask to be invited in. There's no doorknob here because Jesus won't force himself into your heart. He won't force himself into your life. He won't force you into an intimate relationship with him. And so here's the fourth point today. Jesus only comes in when invited, but he asks to be invited. And he's going to knock. But you have to let him in. Let me tell you guys about uh, when this began to happen for me. Again, this is all metaphors around deep spiritual things, mysterious spiritual things. Let me put some flesh and blood on this. When Jesus began to knock on the door of my heart was in 1995. I was uh, 12 years old. I was in fifth grade. And um, my family had just started to go to this church that changed our lives. You guys have heard me talk about it before. Um, before then, I hated church. It was boring. It was irrelevant. I didn't like the people who went there. Many of you can understand the experience like that. It just was what it was. So we started going to this church, and my dad went to this event in 95 called Promise Keepers. Are there any Promise Keepers here in the room? God bless you. God bless you. What Promise Keepers was, uh, was a massive gathering of men uh, to seek God together to become better men, in just a nutshell. And so my dad went to a massive gathering they had with 50, 60,000 men and what's now called the Tropicana Dome in Tampa where the Rays supposedly play baseball. <laughs> They're, ugh, don't even get me started. Okay, so uh, they were in the Tropicana Dome. It was the Thunder Dome then, and uh, it was life-changing. Now, my dad was always a great dad. He was never, um, like, really bad, and then turned around, and all of a sudden he was a great dad. He was always a great husband and father. But let me tell you, dad came home different that night. When he walked in the door, there was something on him. And it felt peaceful. And it felt like love. And it felt gentle. And yet full of life. Just vibrating off of him. And I didn't know what it was, but I knew I wanted it. I literally followed him around the house like a puppy dog. Like, what is that? And whatever it is, I'll do whatever it takes to get it. A couple months later, my brother goes on a missions trip with the same church. He was in seventh or eighth grade. He was in middle school. He went to Poplar Bluff, Missouri, quite possibly the hottest place on earth in the summer. <laughs> Terrible. Anyway, he... Um, he gets back from this mission trip. My family, are, my family and I are there at church at night to pick him up and take him home, just like many of you have done with students here at Via Sun. And we're sitting in the back seat of my parents' Honda Accord, and I noticed that the same thing was on my dad is now on my brother. Peace and love and gentleness and life. It's just radiating off of him. And God bless him. This was a miracle somehow that in his eighth grade self, he looked at me as a fifth grader. Don't ever write off young people. He looked at me and said, Trevor, let me tell you about the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you what it's like when Jesus comes and lives in your heart. It's thrilling. It's exhilarating. It's the greatest thing I have ever sensed or experienced in my life. And you can have it too. 
backseat of my parents' car on the way home. Life-changing moment. And I finally had words to put whatever the it was I wanted. It, it was Jesus making my heart his home. It was Jesus moving into the house of my heart by his Holy Spirit. And I decided in that moment, if that's what that is, I want it. And the first chance somebody gives to me to respond to this, I'm going to do it. And then a month later, I want a sixth grade trip being initiated into the youth group. And the very first chance somebody said, does anybody want Jesus to come into their heart? Me, me, I want him to come into my heart, please. Amen. And all I had to do was ask Jesus to forgive me for my sins, make him the leader of my life, and invite him in. See, all of this was, you feel that on your dad? You feel that on your brother? You hear what your brother's saying to you? Will you please let me in? And let me tell you, I did. First chance I got. And it was all true. Better than I could have ever dreamed. More satisfying than my wildest dreams. More love and joy and hope and peace. Uh, and, and it was all of it, all of it and more, and it's only gotten better since. And it's been 21 years, it's only gotten better. And more than that, I've got this great sensation, but I also found out Jesus forgives me for my sins. I'm a sinner, I didn't know that, but I'm forgiven. And he's a healer. And he gives purpose and life and meaning to it all. But here's the thing. He's knocking on your hearts, too. Are you hearing him? And are you responding? That's where this all lands. I'd like to invite the band to please come on up. This is where this all lands. Do you recognize where he's knocking on your heart now? And are you responding to the knocking that you're hearing? What we're going to do here in a moment is the band is coming forward and coming from the back is I invite you now that we're going to take a moment to pray. So I invite you now, will you bow your heads? Let's have a, a moment of reflection with God. Jeremiah 33.3 gives this promise where God says to his people, call to me and I will answer you. I will show you great and unsearchable things you do not know. And so if you're here in this room today, and you don't know how Jesus has been knocking on your heart, I believe by faith that if you ask him to show you, he will. So in the silence of your own hearts, ask him now, Lord, where are you knocking on my heart? Jesus, if you're real, show me where you're knocking. And even if you already call yourself a follower of Jesus, he might be living in part of your heart and your life, but he wants it all. Ask him where he's knocking. And here's the last question. Where are you knocking on my heart, Lord? And what do you want me to do? How do you want me to respond? Ask that question. The band's going to play a song. We're going to open the steps here for people to come pray. There'll be people on the sides of the room to come pray with you if you want to pray about any of this stuff. Let's seek God together now. Let's listen for knocking and open doors.
you to stand and sing that with us. Come on, invite him in. Invite him to live in your heart like I was talking to you about. There'll be people here on the sides who would love to pray with you and show you how to do that. If there's an area of your life where Jesus is knocking on and it's painful, there are people here to welcome and talk to you, to welcome you and talk to you about it and pray with you through those things. And the steps here are open to come pray and do business with God as long as you need. Don't miss your moment. Don't miss the knocking. Let me pray this over us now to close out our morning or afternoon. This is the same prayer that we read earlier from Ephesians 3, 16 and 17. So I invite you now, prepare your hearts to receive this in. Let me pray this over all of us. I pray that out of his glorious riches, that God may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. May it be so, Lord. We pray this now in the name of the Father and then of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and all of God's people said, Amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you for Christmas candlelight services. <laughs>